pop the um, presentation up one second and then make it nice and big. One second. There we go. Can everybody see that okay? Right. <laughs> I've got nodding heads. This is great. Normally you can't see people on Zoom, but it's great to have to have nodding heads. Great. Um, well, welcome to the Conservation Studio. I feel like I'm inviting you in because I'm in the Conservation Studio here. And I suppose this is the version of the uh, this, this is a version of a studio visit, whereby we would get people into the into the studio and talk and and, and show, talk about conservation and show examples of um, um, show examples of, of work that goes on here. Um, so this, if I can just one second, if I hide my face, okay, great. Um, so, I thought I'd start by um, just describing a bit about um, what conservation is and uh, what the role of the conservator is. There's a fellow conservator, Jenny Mathiason, who describes conservation as harnessing the power of, of um, science to look after heritage, and I quite like that. Um, somebody else once described it as holding off the effects of time by changing the environment. I tend to go with our job is to keep stuff together as much as possible. And it is involved at every single point that you have interaction with documents. So whether that is storage or handling or um, viewing things in the reading room or um, physically treating uh, things from the collection in the studio, it, um, it, it all comes under uh, preservation and conservation. Um, just so you know where we're going with the talk, that's the, the, the plan for, for this little presentation. Um, and then I thought we'd start, um, sorry, just something's popped up. Um, oh, no, let's try again. Okay, so when you're training to be a conservator or if you're interested in conservation, what are the key um, skills that feed into them? It's really important that you have a good manual dexterity. Whether you're involved in conservation or preservation, um, it's really important to have that refined manual, um, manual dexterity um, because there's a lot of detailed work in, in, in intervention. Now, the Furniture Conservation Studio in Letter Fat uh, refer to their five Ps, the five Ps that um, conservators need to have, which is passion, patience, precision, perseverance, and pleasure. Well, I think that I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with them, but I would also put practicality and perspective when we come to archive collection, because um, when you're looking at three million um, um, items. You really have to look at the uh, look at what is going to be of most benefit to as many items as possible. Uh, so you need to have that perspective. What sort of how how the environment will affect the, the, all, all those items? How the storage is going to be changed? So perspective and practicality are really important. Also, organic chemistry feeds into conservation in a massive way because we're expected to know um, at, that, at that level how items, uh, how documents are changing. So for instance, a piece of paper isn't just a piece of paper. It's a piece of paper that's made up of paper fibers. Those paper fibers are made out of, 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 of cellulose. Um, the strands of cellulose are made up of, of monomers. And you need to know how external external elements like light and acid increase the, the rate of those cellu cellulose strands breaking up or what we call depolymerization. Also, it's important to know uh, about uh, solubility. So we might use water or alcohol or um, uh, ketones in the treatment of documents or the cleaning of documents or you know, in, in a variety of ways, and we need to know how that will affect different inks, 
and that will affect um, different um, uh, different um, watercolors or or the like. So it's really important that we know are aware around the organic chemistry. Also, the historical context of the collections. Um, are really important because um, uh, there's never one treatment, there's never one way of, of um, progressing with um, helping a collection. There are always a range of options and it's about choosing the one that's most appropriate to the context and the history of the collection and how that, that collection has been processed. We'll be talking a bit more about the, the production of archive material later on and it all ties into what, how, how interventive you are, how, how, how much you interfere with the object versus how much you, you use um, um, enclosures or changing the environment, you change the environment in, in, instead. And then ethical responsibilities are um, so important that I made the next slide all about ethical responsibilities. Um, so whether um, we have personal membership or uh, institutional membership, conservators um, at Peroni are signed up to both Institute of Conservation and Institute of Conservatory Restorers UK. Um, that, uh, sorry, the Institute, sorry, the Institute of Conservatory Restorers Ireland, my apologies. Um, the core underlying principles of these are that um, treatments have to be minimally invasive, they have to be reversible, they have to be within the skill set of the, uh, of the conservator, they have to be well documented, and you have to be transparent about what you're doing. And um, as I said, there are, there's always more than one treatment option available, and there are always a, a, there's always sort of a scale of how, how why you implement a particular treatment as well. For instance, do you repair every single page, uh, tear, tear of a page, or do you repair that tear that is the, the, the one that's causing um, the structural damage so that there's sufficient time to treat other, um, uh, um, uh, other collections as well? There are always um, balances and um, yeah, there's always about a, and a scaled approach to, to the treatment. What is also frequently discussed in these in these um, professional bodies, the um, code of conduct and the professional standards, is the accountability to the client. And because the public record of Northern Ireland, the the client of the public record of Northern Ireland is. The public of, of, of um, Northern Ireland. It's so important that we do these outreach um, that, that, that we do these out, outreach events and explain how we're treating your archives, what we're doing to um, stabilize them, what we're doing to consolidate them. So I've used preventive and interventive conservation already. So far, um, what's the difference between the two? Well, um, preservation uh, looks at everything that does not physically change the condition of the um, I, of, of the documents. By that I mean it's not interventive conservation. And interventive conservation is when you bring an, a, one item, two items into the studio, you assess its condition, you work out a treatment program, and then you um, carry out treatment, document that treatment. Preservation, preventive conservation, collection care, they're all um, a variation of the, same, of, of the same topic, of the same business area. Um, and they look at all the passive ways that you can really impact and, and improve the condition of, of collections. So we're not going to look at all of these, we're just going to look at some of them. But um, they're all, um, they're, they all make, they all uh, lower the risk of damage. So first of all, we're looking at the 
BEM system, the, the um, environmental monitoring system, we have two within Prodi, two systems that we use. Um, one is the um, building management system, which is built into the building, um, and it gives us the graphs on the left. These are, um, the top one is relative humidity and the bottom one is temperature. They look like they're going up and down all, all the time, don't they? Um, and they are. But actually, if you can see the um, y-axis, the variation is actually less than one degree in the top graph. And I'm sorry, less than one degree in, in the temperature, which is the bottom graph, and maybe one or two degrees in the relative humidity. Um, so they're all perfectly within the, the brackets that we set ourselves. And we try and keep the temperature within one degree fluctuation every day and the humidity within five degrees fluctuation every day. And that is based on um, advice from the uh, British standards. Uh, and on the right, we have the tiny tag system, which are, it's a lot more flexible, but it's, a, it, it's not as, um, yes, it's, 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 it's far less fancy, but it's very practical and flexible. And it gives us the data on um, uh, that, that we can then export out to a um, Excel spreadsheet. So it's very useful and we can change the, the practical, we can change them about between locations, between exhibitions. So the graph on the right was for the um, exhibition area in Prony. And as you can see, the fluctuations every day don't go more than more than a degree because there's about June, July, August, and October, five months worth of data there. So even though it is going up and down, actually, if you look at each day, they're, they're staying very, very um, stable. And this is the exhibition area that's by the door. So it gets the door opening and the door closing. And the reason, uh, and so the blue is the temperature and the green is the relative humidity. And obviously the humidity changes over the seasons. We allow for seasonal shift because winter is wetter and um, summer is drier. And provided that shift is happening over a number of um, months rather than a number of days, then it's, it's, it doesn't have a, a, a negative impact on our collections. So temperature relative humidity, really important because if you can imagine being a document and one day you have lots and lots of, um, it's a really humid day, you have lots, you take on lots and lots of water and then the next day is really dry and so you lose a lot of water. It's, um, it's like being really, really hungry and then having a five course meal and then being really, really hungry again. It doesn't do you any good and it doesn't do the documents any good either. So um, yeah, those are the ways that we look after the environment. The integrated pest management is another really important part of um, reducing risk to the collections. I have to warn you, uh, I have to have to advise you, this, this um, up in the top right corner, the image in the top right corner is not from Prony. It's not from storage area anywhere. <laughs> it's from a really dark, damp basement of a historic house where you would perfectly expect there to be lots of, lots of bugs and beasties. But it's a good example of how our blunder traps work. Because it's a type, we use these, these um, blunder traps here, these triangular traps that, that are the green thing that says trap it. And that allows um, bugs and beasties to stumble onto the really sticky pad. And they stay there. They stay there until you do your routine checks. And um, um, then you can see what's been lurking in the dark and the quiet. Um, and the, um, these, these traps are, we're very, very grateful to our facilities management team who look at these traps for us and um, report back as to what they find. Um, as, as we're very uh, grateful to our facilities management team also for taking snapshots of the BEMS graphs for us as well for, for a, a, a number of months. Um, yeah. So we don't have any problems um, at Prony. We're looking to um, spread these traps out throughout the public areas as well. 
because if we discover insects in the stores, then it's really a, a problem. But if we f try and figure out insects that might be in the building that aren't anywhere near the stores, then we can see we can see them progressing, and we can we can stop things at, a, at an earlier stage as well. So that's that's our next stage for developing the integrated pest management system at Prony, and it will be a purely um, a, a, a purely um, preventive measure, and it'll be. We might we might see more insects. We're fully anticipating seeing more insects because we're keeping windows open more, and that's because of the that's an anti-COVID um, measure. You're meant to be um, keeping things better ventilated, so there are more windows open at the moment. But if we if we're more vigilant about how we look for them, then it should bounce out. Now, if you can see um, this image on the right. That is a, volu a volume that Rose was cleaning um, that came into a prony. And the, the extent of the damage can be quite severe if insects are left to, to eat away at the collections without any, without any restriction, without, any, without um, yes, being, being prohibited. So it's worth doing and it's worth doing well. And it's, it's, it's um, been in place for ever since we've been in this building, but um, you can see the range of, of, of bugs that, that we could be looking at as well. We're, most, we're mostly looking out for the silverfish here and the woolly bears here, the, 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 the carpet beetles. Um, but we've not had, got any infestations. We're all good, we're all fine, but it's a preventive measure. Um, housing and enclosures. Protecting our, our, our cows is very important. We have almost all of our collections in low acidity boxes. The items that aren't in low acidity boxes are either in plant chests, they're large um, paper items, or they're volumes which um, don't, fit into, don't fit into the boxes. Um, and then the next stage of um, looking after our um, the, the next stage of, of, of building in that, that physical protection to our collections is using secondary enclosures. So we're now branching out using these different enclosures um, for, for records as well. Um, volumes can have their own bespoke four flaps. These, these, these photographs here are again, not, not from Pony, but from a previous job where I was an intern and my job was to make four flap enclosures. And so batch after batch, you would make these enclosures to protect the, the uh, volumes. Um, these were library volumes. Um, and then this is a volume, this is a uh, HMP, HMP volume um, in print. They provide a, a really great physical protection actually because they stop dust and um, they stop um, the volumes being knocked when other when um, other materials are being collected or, 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 or returned to the stores. And rolled material is a particular is a yeah it's a particular quandary at the moment because it's you can't you can't put them in a box, you can't put them in um, um, in, in a plan chest. So rolled maps and plans are in cyclopacks at the moment, but you can't really um, provide um, access to collections if they are um, when you're socially distanced. So the cyclopacks at the moment, um, there's the, um, yeah, aren't available and that's because of social distancing. Um, but hopefully we'll get there soon and uh, we'll be able to um, provide access to them again. What, we, what we're doing in the future though is providing, finding a way to get a core in the middle of um, rolled material. So the rolled material could be supported as it's being rolled up and unrolled again. Um, but yes, housing and enclosures, great preventive um, measure. Um, Surveying and condition checking. <laughs> so how do we know the condition of our collections? It's really difficult to try and figure out 
where to target um, housing projects and interventive uh, projects if you don't know what condition the collections are in. And the condition of, of collections can change without noticing because um, measures that were taken in order to keep everything together historically are now causing damage, as you can see from the, the um, official record here. I always say that a, a document handling is all about being tidy. And I'm not a tidy person, but it's really important to be tidy because if, if, if pages are sticking out of archive bond, bundles, then it can actually be quite problematic. Um, uh, and, and especially with the copy paper from the, the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, it will just tear. But what, what is a problem and what isn't a problem? Because the idea that historic collections are all in perfect condition is, is, is a fantasy. We have to, um, again, be practical about what collections we we retain and we don't let be seen because that condition is so bad and what records we allow even though they're not in perfect condition to be viewed because access is really important so um tears uh, tear, torn paper it will, will not prevent anybody viewing collections at prony however a tear in the paper like this one at the bottom is very concerning because that bit of paper is a, a, a nudge away from being lost and then that information is uh, then once that bit of paper is detached it becomes a very high risk of being lost completely and it, it yeah so it's, a, it's always a balance between the risk of of access now and the potential for access in the future so it's tricky it is tricky, but we, we do our best. And if something is close for conservation, it's really important that you talk to somebody about it because it may be that it can't go straight out to the reading room, but it may well be that we can find an alternative situation whereby it's safe to view the documents. For instance, it might be appropriate for you to come up to the conservation studio and view it there, for instance. Um, but it's just, it's not, it's not a document that can go in and out of the reading room without some sort of um, conservation support. And as I was mentioning, the, the collections can change without you even noticing. <laughs> so um, this, this record on the top right, the first page is significantly darker than the second page. And that's because the acidity of the envelope has caused that page to, to oxidize. So even though it's, it's a record, the record isn't damaged and the record's been in a low acidity box, the folder, the, the official record folder, has caused acid migration to discolor this, the, 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 the front page of this folder. So <laughs> it's, it, condition checking is really important. Now, a lot of the material within the uh, conservation, oh, sorry, a lot of material within the archives are functional, practical documents that were created, you know, as, as part of any office, of, as part of any business. And so they have been used, used well and stored practically, you know, and, and, and stored in a way that was easy rather than the way that was of, of um, most sustainable over a number of years. And so you see a lot of damage whereby there's historic mold, for instance, on the right, or there's, oh, I don't know, can you see a red line? I've made a red line. I don't know quite how I did that. <laughs> um, and, and so that, that can also be a cause of a lot of, of, of damage as well. And so, um, yeah, this is, poor, this, is poor, this is historic poor storage that has caused damage in, in, in the long term. But what, what I think is, is uniquely interesting to archive, ooh, oh, I've gone the wrong way, there we go. <laughs> what is uniquely interesting to, to archive collections is that there's a, um, an area between 
book conservation and paper conservation. There's an area between purely archival, uh, pure, pure, purely paper-based collections and library collections. So you have bound letters and you have page, so the volume at, at the bottom here, those are a collection of, of letters from the, the Castlereagh papers, which consist of about 6,000 letters. And they were bound in the late 19th century. And when they came to Pony, they were rebound, they were imaged, they, they, they were copied, and then they were rebound in these blue, uh, in these brown buckram enclosures. But how was that, that, that they were indexed and they were bound? So that they're now one entity rather than being a series of, of, of independent letters. And the, the distinction between one volume and the next then creates a, a relation between those, those documents that uh, wouldn't have existed when they were being created. Likewise, with the pages at the top, they are a, jur a juror's uh, logbook. So they were initially a, a, a volume, they were initially um, one entity, but now they've been removed probably during transport and they, or the transport to print, or, yeah. And now they're individual sheets of paper. It's really interesting because conservators are normally trained as book conservators or we're trained as paper conservators. So it doesn't mean that we, that, that we should be filling the studio with paper conservators and the bound format takes a secondary place to the pages and the information that's on them. Or do we employ book conservators uh, or, or a mixture of two? Or do we need to start training conservators that have an equal, an equal understanding of both? It, it's, it's probably an academic point, but it's, it's one that I find interesting. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. Um, but because of the way the archive material is created, it, it has inherent weaknesses all of its own. So the difference between the majority of books and manuscripts is that they're printed or written before they're bound. But the unique information which, in, which, um, which forms the public record is normally added after the construction of the binding, perhaps daily over a number of years. And so a, a lot of the spines are... Bit, the, the books themselves were functional, practical books. They were then used daily over a number of years after they were bound. And um, a consequence is that the, the boards often detach, the sewing often detaches. There are a number of spinal problems. And if you see this image on the, the bottom left, that is a, a, a volume that has had many pages adhered into it without compensating for the added material. So the whole text block has swell, uh, has, has, there's been a swell in the text block and the spine has contorted. This has, so handling this will be quite precarious and, 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 and tricky and use a book, book sofa, like this, this great book sofa. Similarly, or, or not similarly, the entire opposite is the volume above whereby it's a, it's a register. So half the pages are only half the, the width of the book. So putting any pressure on those pages will then cause folds and dents in, in, in the page that, um, yes, will, will cause, cause a weakness. So given the variety of material that we have in, a, in an archive, how do we, how do we have a, um, how do we have a, cons a, consistency appro a consistent approach to the material that we, to, to, to the different preservation needs? What do we consider a fit for access, which can go in and out of the reading room without conservation support, material that needs conservation support, and material that is in such poor condition that um, there's a risk of, of losing unique information if, um, if the object isn't consolidated. Well, this is a, a, a form that I put together for um, document production and historical researchers so that when non-conservation 
uh, members of staff are looking at the, the records, there's some sort of overview as to what should be flagged up to conservation and, 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 and what, is, what is fine. Um, document handling. We've looked at a number of the, the um, external factors that can impact the records. Um, the main risk of damage to documents is poor handling. The good news is it's the main cause of damage that's easiest to fix because good document handling is pretty is 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 um, e e easy to to um, take on. We've gone th these are the cushions that we have. And we invested in these grey cushions, which are book sofas, and they're brilliant. You can put almost any volume in there, and it's properly supported. But I've taken a number of photographs as to um, good ways that the um, volumes, the documents, the maps, the plans, the parchments can be viewed without causing any uh, any further damage. So we've looked at official records already. And we've seen the really thin, lightweight paper and the, the potential for, for that to tear. So it's really important that the um, treasury tag is extended as much as it can. And then the pages are turned um, in, in, small, uh, in, in small quantities uh, through the text block, so, sorry, through, through the archive bundle. And if you have a, an archive bundle that is that is stapled, then just um, use weights to support the pages rather than holding them yourself, because it's it's it's, it's a lot easier to 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 handle them that way. Um, if you come across rusty nails, please please don't remove them. If that if that paperclip is is removed, then there's a really high chance that there'll be a tear in that paper. Um, so please tell us and, and somebody will, will remove that, that, that paper clip and, and find so, so an alternative to keep the pages together. Also, inks. Please, please try and avoid touching the inks because if you can touch areas of the page that aren't typed or, or um, written on, then there's a far, there's, uh, it, it, it's far better for the inks and have a better example of that later on. Um, if you come across a lease or a will or a, a bunch of letters that are folded like this, again, very gently, bit by bit, open them up, ask for help if you want it, and use weights to hold pages in place whilst you're going, whilst you're going through them. Um, folded parchment. Again, similar to the, the, the pages that we looked at before, um, open things up in, in multiple stages, use the weights, try not to touch the, the areas that have writing on them, mainly because um, the um, parchment isn't porous. So the writing sits on top of the skin rather than being absorbed into the parchment like, paper, like ink would be absorbed into paper. Um, paper is really porous, it absorbs the ink, it's, it's, it's more stable, but um, the ink on parchment is, is far more likely to, to, to flake off. And so um, handling the edges is, is really a great thing. Small volumes. Um, small volumes can be, oh, always use a, a cushion for, for volumes. And we have a huge variety available. A volume like this, that is um, a, a composite volume where you've got bits glued in, adhered, tucked into to the text block. Um, be very gentle opening them, the, the, you know, but, uh, and again, they can protrude from the foredge that make, which is a particularly fragile area. But if you have them in a stable, in a good cushion, Maybe if you want to ask for a bit of paper to, to go behind it to provide a bit more support, then again, ask if you need it. Um, larger volumes are a bit more problematic and you can see the difference between the different cradles. Um, always or, be, be generous with the cradle that you're using. 
um, and uh, we want to make sure that that spine, we were looking at the spines earlier on and how they're a real area of weakness for a lot of our volumes. If the spine is well supported, then it's a, a really a, a great benefit to our collect, a benefit to looking after the collections. You can use a cushion on one side in some instances, um, but um, you, the, the, the spine will move as the as you go through the the, the volume, go through the, the book. And so, it, again, these book sofas, they cost a fortune, but they're fantastic. Um, they, you can really set a volume in there and, and look through it uh, far, far more comfortably. And use the snake weights if they're, benef uh, you know, if, if you're wanting to hold the page open, because the snake weights won't, um, won't um, disturb the inks in the same way as, as your hands will. Um, if some books will be too big for the, um, sorry, just get rid of that. Okay, uh, some books will be too big for the cradles. Um, that's because they did not think about the cradles when they were choosing what books to write in. Um, so for instance, this valuation, um, for this volume from the valuation collect, uh, office um, requires two, two cushions or a, a pile of the flatter cushions and, and, and a big cushion. Uh, it's just making sure that the spine is well supported. And there is, there's, no, there's no right or wrong with document handling, there isn't. There's just well supported and not supported. Um, there are a number of ways that you can handle document correctly. Ask for help if you have any questions. Um, but it's really important that you Look at look at the material that you're you're look, that you're researching, looking at the um, um, yeah material that you that, that that you're sorry this um, wait a minute, one second um, okay <laughs> that that you're looking at the historic material um, seeing how the material will move um, seeing where it might be weak and supporting it. And if I can influence the, the sort of thought process you have when you get um, uh, the archive of collections over the, the issue desk, then that's far more valuable than sort of this cradle is better than that cradle because the collections vary so much. It's actually really difficult to say, this is good and this, this, is, this is not so great. Another reason why I, it's, it's so important not to touch the inks. It's because this is because of the damage that you can see here. The other side of this page is, is all written on, but you can see here, oh, no, you can see here the ink from the other side coming through. And that is because this volume is written in iron gold ink. It's a corrosive ink. You could smell it when you open the book, but this is a really, um, uh, this, this is a significant level of deterioration. It's a really aromatic iron gold ink volume. And this area had become moist. And the other part of the area had not become moist. And that moisture had acted as a catalyst for the deterioration of the ink. Um, it, it, it was fascinating, <laughs> but also a really good indicator of how um, uh, how moisture and, and, and heat can affect inks. And unless you spend all day obsessing about them like I do, it's really difficult sometimes to, to tell the difference. So just don't touch any of them, if at all possible. <laughs> that would be really great. Photographs. This is the, the one point where we will ask you to wear nitrile gloves, not cotton gloves, but, but nitrile gloves. Um, and um, if, if for some reason you haven't been given them, then you're given the photographs, then please ask for them. Um, photo, it's, it's really important to keep photographs in order, although they should be individually um, itemized. Um, and light damage is cumulative and irreversible. So if you could only have them face up when you're looking at them and then turn them over, 
so that they're not getting that light exposure that would be a really beneficial thing in in preserving the the um, um, definition of the image as you can see on the photograph on the left here the bottom left there was a paper clip uh, attaching a, a note to the, the the photograph and that middle image shows the the damage that that paper clip has done at indentation and so um, again if you come across any paper clips like that do let us know we will find an enclosure and improve that but um um, don't try and do it yourself, please, <laughs> because I spend time training people on how to remove a paper clip properly, not just sliding it off so that um, it can uh, catch the, 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 the paper or, or, or the photograph. Um, and when you're lifting photographs, this is my hand here on, on the right, if you support it from, from below and try and avoid touching the, the image, that's also really important to, to the stability of the, of the image. Lastly, from the, document, the, from the document handling, are rolled items. I was mentioning, um, not particularly eloquently earlier on, uh, the, um, the, the problems with, with rolled collections in that it's really normally a two-person job. And if you get any rolled collections, then do ask for help because they're difficult at the best of times. And this middle image I was trying to take while I was unrolling this myself, and even I was struggling. So um, if you roll it out just maybe 10 or 20 centimeters and put a weight on the, the uh, open edge and then roll the, the um, roll this, this, this um, print or maps or parchment or whatever it may be, slowly, slowly out, you can pause at any point and, and add weights. There are usually plenty of weights in the reading room, um, and then have it rolled out. Then it can be it can be viewed for for as long as you need it, and then gently roll it back up again. As I said, the next step in looking at this is to to find a way to add cores in a in that core to roll um, collections around. But that's 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 a, that's a future project that, that we're looking forward to. Um, yeah, and then some pretty images at the end, before and afters. So this is the Shaw family tree, um, which was requested for um, access about two months ago during lockdown. Um, but as you can see, it was in, in um, quite, quite a poor condition. It had been stored folded rather than folded up and that had exacerbated the, the tears at the at the edges as well and so in the bottom right corner you can see the importance of cleaning and the impact of cleaning so this was just with a smoke sponge a sponge that was developed to um, clean soot of, of wallpaper and it's it's it, it's great at removing dirt without disturbing pencil marks which is good because there were some some on this and then with uh, a wheat starch paste, which has uh, undergone accelerated and aging tests as, as a material for, for conservation. And Japanese paper, which is a, 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 good, a, a long fiber, a long, a, a, which is good for, a lightweight strong fiber, which is good for repairs. Um, a very translucent paper, so it doesn't mark, uh, um, mask the, the writing beneath. Um, so yes, this is now that. And then on the right as well, you can see the, the infills and, 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 and the, atta the attached bits of paper. Um, next one, again, was done in the last fortnight. Um, this is an infill at the top. So that's the, re the replacement bit of paper. It's a, a Japanese, uh, I want to say 24 GSM page. Um, and it was um, selected because it was a similar weight to the map and you want to match, match the, the weight of the original paper. And this, this, this map was humidified in, the, in, our, in our humidification chamber on top of the suction table there, where you um, add a very fine mist and it relaxes the paper. This is, this is actually a different map, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, and it, it, it relaxes the paper and then you can put it between blotters. 
so that um, as it dries, it dries flat. Um, because this came out of this, this, this is this is rolled previously, and then it makes it much easier to match up the um, the, the tears. So um, I don't know if you can see my uh, my arrow, but this, this this was one of the tears. So this is it before, this is it after, and this this is one of the tears here, and along here as well. But it now means that it's gone from something which was at quite a high risk of, of tearing further to something that's now um, that's now consolidated and, and easy to access in the reading room. Um, and then uh, this the, the problem with this letter was that the um, ink was that the creative ink that I mentioned earlier. Um, it was in, in, a, in a pretty good condition, but the um, iron gold ink testing strip came back pink, which shows that there's the um, corrosive ink. So I had to use a remoistable tissue, uh, which you, um, where, which is one that we make here in the studio, where you apply the adhesive to the tissue onto a bit, uh, you get um, inert plastic and you apply the adhesive onto the tissue and let it dry. And then you cut it up so that the, the, the top image on the right is it, being, is it cut into strips. And then you brush it onto damp blotters and then you pick, which, which reactivates the adhesive. And then you transfer it to the original document and um, brush it in place. So there's very little, uh, well, there's far, more, far less moisture than there the would have been in a traditional repair that you saw on, on the previous slide. Um, but it, it just it, it, it makes it, it's, it's far better for the inks. It keeps the inks a lot more stable um, to use this this method with with far less moisture. And then oh, I thought I had one more, but I don't. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, yes, that's that's it. That is the before and afters. Um, All right. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> we do have a few.